rays from foggy mists. Spectral visitors from the days when men went down to the sea. From the darkest waters of the North Atlantic to the rocky coast of California, caught between the surface of the sea and the watery grave, lies the domain of haunted ships. somewhere out there and uh, get out of here. I threw the covers back quickly, sat up, and nobody was there. They weren't real men. They were these shadowy figures that looked from a distance like they were sailors. And a voice said, I want you. Do phantoms wander the decks of aging vessels, searching for salvation that never comes? Ghost ships prowl the high seas, serving as harbingers of doom for those who cross their bow. The answers may lie along the docks of seafaring towns where ghostly tales are told by those who have spent their years at sea. So tell me, when you're standing watch late at night, have you felt a tap on your shoulder? Just a touch. Late at night, you hear the cry of a whale. Sounds from the sea. There's a ship called the Great Eastern. It was five times the size of the largest ship of its day. It was the Titanic of its time. It was a cursed ship. The Great Eastern was a marvel to behold. When she was built in 1857, there was nothing else like her afloat. At 680 feet long, the Great Eastern was five times larger than any other ship. She could carry 4,000 passengers and 400 crew, twice that of any other vessel. And she was powered by a complex system of paddle wheels, propellers, and sailing masts. This was a phenomenal ship. They started building it in London, and by the time they got it finished, it took three and a half years. 2,000 men, riveters, carpenters, whatever, working on the ship. She was the dream of the most famous shipbuilder of the day, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, an Englishman nicknamed the Little Giant. His firm, the Great Western Railway Company, dominated the world. The Great Eastern was to be the jewel in his crown. Instead, it became his ship of doom. The trouble began the day the Great Eastern was launched. As she moved down the dry dock toward the water, a mooring cable snapped, whipped through the air, and killed two workers. After she was launched, crews continued working on the ship. While carpenters finished the deck, Riveters worked on the Great Eastern's most unique feature, her double hull, an innovation for the day. Engineers believed this dual layer of iron would make the ship safer. Instead, it became an integral part of her mysterious haunting. Two of the riveters were missing, and they thought what had happened is that they had actually sealed themselves into this great ship by mistake. Well, they searched all over the place for these two riveters, and they couldn't find them. 
The missing riveters were soon forgotten, but the Great Eastern's litany of troubles was just beginning. Help! On her first sea trial, a boiler blew up. Three men died, five were scalded, and another crewman jumped overboard to avoid the explosion. He was crushed in the ship's flashing paddle wheel. When the ship dropped anchor, the captain and four others took a dinghy to shore. But the dinghy overturned and all five were drowned. Now, this just brought on more and more ideas from the public that this ship, something was wrong with the ship. Though she could hold 4,000, there were just 35 paying passengers aboard for her first Atlantic crossing. There was very little faith that the Great Eastern would work. You only have one chance uh, when you're at sea on board a ship. If you're not on, a, on board a ship that you trust, um, you're in big trouble. Anything went wrong with the ship, anything out of the norm, people had a tendency to look at that ship as a voodoo ship or you know, a vessel really to be afraid of. It was then that the haunting of the Great Eastern began. The men keep saying they're hearing this noise. Passengers and crew started to hear noises, tapping, moans and shouts coming from the ship's hull. An inspection turned up nothing. I am concerned. I have to, I have to look after the... When the Great Eastern arrived in New York with her frightened passengers, her problems continued. The paddle wheels came in and took five feet of the dock away. I mean, just splintered the whole dock. Two inspectors came down to uh, look at the damage, fell overboard and died. To make matters worse, uh, some sailors came down, drunk to the gills. Uh, they also fell overboard and one of them drowned. The Great Eastern was a cursed ship for everybody. Those who were working aboard, those who, uh, who, who traveled aboard, but no more so than for the owner, Brunel. In her first year at sea, Isambard Kingdom Brunel suffered two strokes and died. Passengers who dared travel aboard her were subjected to horrific moments of full-fledged hauntings. And they heard moaning, you know, and then they thought, well, could it be the riveter inside the hull trying to get out? In 1860, while dropping anchor outside of New York, the Great Eastern once again encountered bad luck, this time in the form of a rock that gashed her outer hull. A crew of riveters was brought in to fix the damage. And when they got down there, what did they hear but the tap, tap, tap of the old riveter. They had heard the story. They knew that two men were missing and they were probably in there and the ghosts were tapping on the hull. And there was a definite tap, tap, tap on the hull. They came up and refused to work. In 1866, an investor named Cyrus Beale purchased the ship for a fraction of what it was worth. He gave the Great Eastern its only moment of glory. Beale put 3,000 miles of coiled steel inside her massive hull and laid the first transatlantic cable. Without incident, the ship crossed the sea five times. But once finished laying cable, Beale put her up for auction. The French government bought her, believing they could transform the Great Eastern into a luxury liner. But she was once again plagued with mismanagement. She sailed only once, and the venture ended in financial disaster. In May 1889, she was sold to an English company for scrap. The Great Eastern was dead. It was over. It had lasted 30 years, 31 years, and 33 people had died aboard her. And the wreckers who had the scrap, who had the job of tearing this ship apart, which was a job in itself, mutinied as well and started fighting each other. And a guy got killed, got hit over the head by one of the other gangs. And there was another death, a final death. But the Great Eastern had one last gasp of fame. 
a few days later newspapers were again filled with reports from the dry dock i'm gonna have to read this because i i just have to read it when i read it in the old newspaper it uh, really tells the whole story and it was uh, one of the riveters taking apart the ship that said we were breaking in a compartment in the inner shell of the port side when a shriek went up that stopped all work. We found a skeleton inside the ship's shell. It was the skeleton of the old Basher Riveter, who was missing before. So the ghost was real. <laughs> there actually was a ghost of the Great Eastern. For how long they lived, nobody knows. But the ghost of the Great Eastern was a real ghost. The ghosts of the Great Eastern brought misery to those who sailed there. But other hauntings are more mysterious. For these stowaway spirits, a ship makes the perfect place for a phantom's playground. For those who go down to the sea, superstition has always ruled the waves. Death and danger can be predicted by the color of the sunrise and sunset. Red at night, a sailor's delight. Red in the morning, a sailor's warning. A death at sea takes on an even more ominous hue. It was a tall ship out of New Zealand called the Star of India. And there was a little boy, a stowaway, who was found on board, forced into labor. One day, he decided he was going to show off and climb to the highest mast. And a wave struck the ship. Down he went. She was launched in 1863 at Ramsey, on the Isle of Man. She was originally called the Euterpe, named after the ancient Greek muse of music and poetry. She would later be named the Star of India. During the last half of the 19th century, the 205-foot, three-masted ship transported thousands of passengers from England to New Zealand. It was the desire to find a better home which lured an 11-year-old boy named Oswald Letts to stow away on the ship. Letts and two of his mates were found in the ship's hold several days out to sea. The captain made them work for their food, but most of the time they spent playing games of tag on deck. A game that was played on the decks of the ship with the children of the immigrants was a game of tag, similar to what we play today in this country, but in England, at the turn of the century, you didn't just reach out and touch the person and say, tag, you're it, you made a little S on their back. Halfway across the South Pacific, Oswald Letts played a more deadly game. He was showing off to his friends, yelling up, because the old saying on the ship, you always have one hand for yourself and one hand for the ship. And he was showing off to his friends, yelling, look at me, look at me. The boy held onto the ropes for as long as he could. But the wind and the stinging salt air eventually weakened his grasp. He fell to the deck in the ship's hold more than 100 feet below. The date is marked in the ship's log, June 29th, 1884. But the tragic fall was not the end of young Oswald Letts. Somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, the young stowaway found a new way to play aboard the Star of India. During subsequent voyages, passengers and crew began to notice something not right on board, especially in the ship's hold. Some reported feeling a presence while being alone. Others heard the giggling of a child in empty rooms. But perhaps the most chilling accounts come from those who actually felt a finger drawn on their back. If you'd be asleep in the forepeak and you feel something... 
like waking you up for your watch. But scribe a S down your back and you look and no one's there. It'd be old Oswald Lutz playing with you. But not all hauntings aboard the Star of India are so playful. She is still used today as an educational ship. In the first mate's cabin, some say a more evil presence lurks. Legend has it that a drunken passenger in a suicidal frenzy had cut his own throat. The ship's surgeon stitched together the gash in the man's neck and the patient was put in the first mate's cabin. But sometime during the night, the man ripped out his stitches and bled to death. Eight decades later, Star of India volunteer Karen Wyman was settling in for a night's sleep in the same room. It was a cold night and I got dressed in my warm clothes and climbed into the bunk here and that's where it all began. I was trying to fall asleep when suddenly it felt like somebody was poking the top of the sleeping bag and I froze. I got nervous and then suddenly it felt like somebody was trying to pull the sleeping bag off of me, off of my head. And I threw the covers back quickly, sat up and nobody was there. Karen spent a restless night watching the shadows from the sea dance on the walls. The next morning, another volunteer told her about the macabre events that had occurred in the cabin. Today, the Star of India is anchored in the port of San Diego, California. Each year, thousands of tourists cross her gangway, trying to glimpse life on the high seas in the late 19th century. But few of those visitors know that the Star of India is haunted. I don't really believe in ghosts, but like I say, uh, we've had so many people come on board from all different walks of life, different countries, different languages, and, and they seem to describe feeling the same breeze where no breeze could be, or the S in their back. So it makes you think. You got a, a ship that's been around for a few hundred years, a number of people are gonna die on it, and spirits just don't leave like a lot of people think. It's, they continue on. And they're gonna continue in something that they feel is their home. I mean, a young lad, like 10 or so, dies. I mean, this is what it's going to be. He doesn't know anything better, so he's going to stay on board that ship. But some spirits that haunt the seas are not limited to the decks of a single ship. These phantoms have the ability to move from ocean to ocean. They appear in violent storms or in the dead of night bringing tidings of salvation or warnings of impending doom. In the fishing village of Morro Bay along the coast of central California, the sea dominates all aspects of life. The town is known for its picturesque boats and docks and the violent waters that thunder just outside its harbor. It was in this churning surf some 20 years ago that sailor Popeye Thornburr found himself face to face with a phantom of the sea. Thornburr was skippering a fishing boat when he and his two-man crew were caught in a ferocious storm. I was on watch the first night of that storm and turn, the, the wind came from ahead of us around to, the, to our stern. The sea was a following sea. And I remember once looking back, I looked back like that at the ocean. It came down so hard, it made everything shudder. It broke a lot of the, the equipment on the boat. There was no turning around or we would have been going right back into the sea. His two shipmates went below, but Thornbur stayed at the wheel, desperately trying to keep the boat from crashing onto the rocks. At some point during that night, I had my arm wrapped around the binnacle. The binnacle, as the 
compass in it a face started appearing in that binnacle it was red with white highlights a finger came out from that face and pointed at me and a voice said I want you I just hollered at my crew and said guys I'm coming down below I'm going crazy up here and I went down below I didn't tell anybody what had happened I was afraid to we made it we got picked up a uh, hundred miles north of there by a Danish freighter they saw our last flare not long after the storm subsided. Thornbur was stunned by what he had seen, but told no one. Several years later, I was reading in one of our weekly newspapers about a Norwegian spirit. He's a spirit, a good luck spirit for Norwegian fishermen. He's called Clau Boderman. The uh, myth goes that if you are ever visited by Clau Boderman, neither you nor your crew will ever be taken by the sea. I'm sorry, I'm shaking right now. After we were rescued from that storm, we found out that we were the only full crew to get out of that storm alive. Neither I nor my crew were taken by the sea. I was visited by Clau Boderman. I'm Norwegian. But not all seagoing ghosts bring such good tidings. Ah, storms. You're afraid of storms, man. Ah, uh, like any I've seen storms in our time. You want to hear of storms at sea and ships. It's a tale of the Flying Dutchman. Have you heard of that one? Long ago, a Dutch fisherman decided he wanted the fastest ship in all the seas and made a deal with the devil for his soul. That's a tale to tell. To this day, she is the most famous ghost ship afloat, the Flying Dutchman. The mere mention of her name is synonymous with sea hauntings. Ghost ships are always called the Flying Dutchman. There are thousands of Flying Dutchmen. People are seeing the Flying Dutchman every day. Uh, fascinating it is that, that many people, even today, say they saw the Flying Dutchman. The origin of the Flying Dutchman is unknown, and there are so many versions of her story that maritime folklorists say finding her home port is impossible. But there are consistencies in the tales that help paint a portrait of this ghostliest of ships. Different versions of the story have the Dutchman first heading to sea anywhere from the 13th to the 17th centuries. She was a galleon manned by a wicked Dutch captain and his crew. They crossed the high seas, drinking, carousing, and pirating for pleasure. But the Dutchman's captain was never satisfied. He always wanted more. Some say he desired the fastest ship at sea and sold his soul to get it. Another version of the story says that the Flying Dutchman was a brash captain named Vanderdecken. He vowed to sail around the notorious Cape of Good Hope, even if he had to sail against the wind. The gods of the oceans heard him boast and put the captain to sea, forever. Each day he was forced to try and sail around the Cape, and each day he would fail, having to try again the next. Other Flying Dutchman stories talk of a more humane Dutchman, a man haunted by his own wickedness. In that version, the captain returned home and was told his brother and his wife were having an affair. 
In a jealous rage, he kills them both, only to find out later that the story is not true. And he gets on his ship with the idea that he's going to kill himself. He's going to smash his ship into a reef. But the powers above won't let him commit suicide, won't allow him to have the ship hit the waves or hit the rocks. He must sail forever in the ship, the Flying Dutchman. He will never get a port, and he must just sail from one sea to the other, all seven seas, constantly till the end of time. From that moment forward, the Flying Dutchman and his cursed crew aimlessly sailed the seas, seeking redemption. Regardless of which version of the story is told, to have an encounter with the billowing white sails of the Flying Dutchman became a sailor's most dire warning. Seeing the ghost ship was a bad omen, and um, a ghost ship often was something that, of course, everyone was afraid of because they could at any moment become a ghost ship themselves. In the days when sailors believed in sea monsters and mermaids, the Flying Dutchman was just another hazard of the ocean. But there may be a logical explanation for seeing these ethereal visions. Perhaps they were hallucinations, phantoms created in the eyes of those who had been at sea too long. Another explanation is that images of ships hundreds of miles away can bounce off clouds, creating the illusion of a spectral visitation. There were tricks of science, such as mirages, which are actual objects over the horizon, fragments of which can be refracted on the sky above the horizon, so that you could actually see a piece of an island or a piece of the land or even a ship that is then moving in the wrong direction. All sorts of strange things appeared, and some of them are actually explainable by optical illusion. Other ones are explainable by mere hallucinations, by things people see because they stare at the sea for so long. But hallucinations and tricks of sunlight cannot explain every encounter with the Flying Dutchman. At the end of the 19th century, a British sailing ship captained by the man who would later become King George V of England was nearly run over by what the crew says was the Flying Dutchman. She came at us at full sail, as if she were to split us in two. At the last moment, she pulled alongside, glowing in the night. We saw no crew, but her rigging was illuminated as if it were the brightest day. After she passed, she disappeared into the night and was gone. The legend of the phantom captain and his ship continues to this day. In the Bermuda Triangle, a guy recently said he saw the full rigged ship, Flying Dutchman, full of skeletons sailing by him. And it wasn't just him, but his daughter and his, and his, and his wife saw the same thing. Mass hallucination? Who knows? Though the ship has sailed the sea for centuries, there is hope for the beleaguered captain of the Flying Dutchman. Many versions of his story end with a chance at salvation. The Dutchman can be freed from his bondage under one condition. Find the love of a good woman. Like so many legends, the moral of the story is that true love can conquer all, even the curse of the sea. For other more industrial spirits, simply continuing what they were doing while alive is enough. A haunting in Salem, Massachusetts seems to confirm that the work of a fisherman who dies at sea is never done. The New England coast has always been famous and infamous for its seafaring ghosts. One prime spot which those spirits seem to favor is the town of Salem, Massachusetts.
best known as the home to the notorious witch trials of 1692, Salem was also once the nation's busiest port. Hundreds of ships, mostly fishing vessels, traveled in and out of Salem and nearby Gloucester. Many never returned. March 7, 1870, one of the century's worst hurricanes turned the New England sky black. The sloop Charles Haskell was anchored off the shoals of George's banks when the storm hit. There were a hundred schooners or other vessels fishing in this very confined area. So when the storm hit, you know, you have a real problem, the potential to all run aground on one of the shoals or to collide with another vessel was very real. So they did the only thing they could do, batten down the hatches, take down the sails, and throw out the storm anchor. And uh, by 6 o'clock that night, the hurricane was in full force. Suddenly, the ship's anchor broke. The Charles Haskell was at the mercy of the sea. Unable to control the ship, the crew could only hang on and hope. Then, through the darkness, a sailing ship called the Andrew Johnson appeared directly in the path of the Haskell. They just crushed it. You know, within a second they were on it, there was no time for the Johnson to get out of the way, and they cut the vessel almost in half. You know, they hit it broadside. And one of the members of the crew on the Haskell said that he looked over, and they were really right in the middle of the Johnson. And he said some of the crew members, had they not been in shock, could have boarded the Haskell had gotten away, but they were just in shock, and they didn't react quickly enough, and the Johnson went down and killed 10 men. Miraculously, the Haskell was not seriously damaged. Three weeks later, the crew of the Haskell put back to sea and drifted straight into an extraordinary encounter with the unknown. Legend has it that the crewmen of the Andrew Johnson emerged from their watery grave. Up in the front of the vessel in the bow, standing there in oil skins dripping wet, were a group of crewmen. And they weren't real men. They were these shadowy figures that looked from a distance like they were sailors. The mysterious figures moved around on deck. The crew of the Haskell panicked. The ghosts did not approach the crew. Instead, they picked up the ship's nets and started fishing. They're just going through the motions of being fishermen. It's this spectral uh, crew. And at one point, the captain's up, and he's on the watch. And he says that one of the members of this spectral crew looks at him and engages him face to face, which hadn't been done before. And he said this supernatural crew member just kind of shook his head and gave him a wry smile, maybe sort of a way of visually or you know, referring to the fate that had been fallen. Reports of hauntings aboard the Haskell continued for years. Nearly every trip made to sea was followed by tales of ghostly fishermen coming aboard. There's not a lot of documented cases on the North Shore. You know, I mean, there are not a lot of them to be found that are documented to this extent, but the ones that there are, it seems that there were people who had died away at sea and their lives were unsettled. Again, I think they say a lot of times, even on land, that people who died, you know, there's some part of their life that was unfulfilled or some circumstance about the death that were unfulfilled, and that's why they're left to sort of roam restlessly and, you know, trying to get to where they should have been. Lives cut short at sea is a common theme aboard haunted ships, even when the vessel is no longer afloat. Take, for example, the story of Miller's Wharf in Salem. During the early years of the 20th century, a man named Miller wanted to add a second story to a dockside building he owned. To make the job easier, he used the hull of an overturned barge he simply knocked in a few windows and a door, and he had a ready-made addition. What he didn't know was that the captain of that barge had been murdered while he slept in his bunk. In 1979, a local businessman named Mike Brissell was considering turning the building into a restaurant. 
he asked his friend, Salem author Bob Cahill, for his opinion. I went into what was originally the old pilot house of this barge. And I'm looking around, and I hear, get out of here. Now, the windows were closed. And at first, I thought, maybe it's Mike having fun with me. And I wasn't sure, did I hear what I heard? Then I heard it again, and in fact, more forcefully. And it was like an echo, you know, like a voice from, from somewhere out there. And uh, get out of here. Well, I did just that. I got out of there. Spooked by his close encounter, Cahill began doing research. He discovered that the barge captain, Charles Wynan, had been hacked to death in 1911 with an axe while taking a nap in his cabin. The captain's last words were reported to have been, get out of here. The old cook, William DeGraff had actually joined the crew of the barge on purpose to kill Captain Wyman. That 20 years earlier, Wyman, on a schooner out of uh, Maine, had taken a whip to de Graff in the rigging and whipped him right out of the rigging for something he had done. And de Graff fell and was crippled for life. And that de Graff had waited 20 years to come back, join the crew. Wyman apparently didn't recognize him. And his, his one reason was to murder uh, Captain White. By the way, it's exactly 88 years to the day that the murder was committed. Shall we go down to uh, Miller's Bluff? Now called Hawthorne Cove Marina, the building has been drastically improved from its earlier days. Always seemed to be coming from right here, you know, get out of here. And then I just kind of looked around and waited. Mike Purcell was way down the other end of the building. And I could see him because I thought at first he was pulling my leg. And I heard it again, get out of here. And that's just what I did. Went right back out that way, out the back door. Uh, this was the pilot house of the barge. And now they've, I, I notice now, They've done the ceiling over. They've hidden the barge, which is kind of interesting. Um, so if Charles Wyman of the Glendora is, is here, this is, uh, you know, this is his place now. Uh, maybe he's gone off into nether netherland at this point. I don't know. Uh, would I live here? I don't think so. I don't think so. Captain Wyman may no longer haunt his barge but it's thought spirits of other dead sailors continue to search for salvation. Believers say that when a sailor is murdered at sea, his ghost will not rest until his death is avenged. There are storms you should hear about. There are ships you should never look for. Sparky and I have been through many a storm together, from the eastern seaboard of the United States to Great Britain. This is the tale to tell. Since the first ship set sail on the oceans, there have been tales of vessels lured to their deaths. The sirens of Greek mythology enticed ships toward land, only to have them crash onto the rocks. In the glory days of tall ships, residents of some coastal towns made a living from the cash of goods that washed ashore. The average person didn't travel very much in the, the two and three hundred years ago. And so um, if something came ashore on your beach, it was like a windfall. It may have traveled 50 miles, it may have traveled 3,000 miles. And so often, people on shore became the passive recipients of shipwrecks. So there was a disaster at sea, one person's loss becomes another one's gain. Taking that one step farther, you have people who actively participate in the wrecking of ships in order to gain economically from what washes up on shore. And the reason they were called wreckers for the most part was if they didn't get a ship that come in on its own, they'd bring it in. 
you know, they got false lights. And uh, you know, the ship would see another light, think it was another ship, thinking everything was fine, that there was enough water there, and they'd come in and wreck. Wreckers operated well into the 1900s, mostly in coastal villages along the North Atlantic seaboard. They used false lights to lure ships to shore. Some went a step further. In many cases, like in Rhode Island, uh, Block Island is, is, is known for its wreckers, the, the people would kill everybody aboard. A uh, ship came in because that, there were no witnesses. ashore or uh, a ship that disappeared from um, an anchorage just offshore um, was if there were no survivors to tell the story about what might have happened to the ship. But as with most tales of ghosts and haunted ships, the sea does not let evil go unpunished. In Rhode Island, one story is told that sends chills down the spines of those who dare to live off the misery of others. In the early 1900s, on a windswept beach, the spirits of dead sailors brought their own form of revenge upon Block Island's notorious wrecking crew. The victims of the ships sometimes would act revengeful and would actually drag the wreckers down into the sea uh, from the beach, from the wreck itself. And that became a great hoodoo of the, of the wrecking crew, that uh, the victims of these ships, who uh, some of them would they'd kill very easily without any remorse, uh, would get their revenge on them. And uh, in some instances, they did. In seaports, large and small throughout the world, stories of ghosts and haunted ships receive the same respect given to the sea. The sea is a very romantic place, and stories about the sea as they're told over the course of time, and they sort of take on a, an additional life of their own, or they're so much enhanced. Those who believe the stories do so with reverence. I don't believe in spirits, but I was visited. I, I will always listen, though. I don't believe I would ever be visited again but I'm not afraid of spirits. Those who are skeptical dismiss the stories with the utmost caution. I'm always afraid to say I don't believe in ghosts because those tend to be the people from my experience that end up having these encounters. But why are there so few modern tales of hauntings on the high seas? Perhaps it's because we have stopped looking. People spend less time at sea, or even looking at the sea, than ever before. Although um, You can go to the beach and spend time looking at the sea, you're spending time looking at your lemonade and at your book and at the beach ball. Some say it is still possible to witness ghostly visitations on the waves, if you're willing to experience the sea like sailors of days gone by. Take a slow boat across the ocean, one that will travel weeks or even months before it reaches the next shore. You are just staring at the ocean, and there's nothing around. You're grasping for the smallest particle of information, a bird flying overhead, uh, something floating in the water, something that you thought was floating in the water, some seaweed that has a pattern in it that might tell you something, because you're completely isolated from the rest of the world. The endless sea of blue lies the spirits that hundreds of years ago gave birth to ghostly tales. Tales that are as old as the sea. Ah, come on, Sparky. Ah. Our tales are told. Besides, no one believes in ghosts. This high-flying, real-life series will have you airborne. Can you get me an anxiety pill, please? On airline. Then, let the games begin on Caesars 24-7, where the stakes are high and the bets are real. Whoa! You took my money!
money. Airline, <laughs> followed by Caesars 24-7. Tuesday, starting at 10, only on Via. True story. When the Great Eastern arrived in New York with her frightened passengers, her problems continued. The paddle wheels came in and took five feet of the dock away. I mean, just splinted the whole dock. Two inspectors came down to uh, look at the damage, fell overboard and died. To make matters worse, uh, some sailors came down, drunk to the gills. Uh, they also fell overboard and one of them drowned. The Great Eastern was a cursed ship for everybody. Those who were working aboard, those who, uh, who, who traveled aboard, but no more so than for the owner, Brunel. In her first year at sea, Isambard Kingdom Brunel suffered two strokes and died. The few passengers who dared travel aboard her were subjected to horrific moments of full-fledged hauntings. thought, well, could it be the Riveter inside the hull trying to get out? In 1860, while dropping anchor outside of New York, the Great Eastern once again encountered bad luck, this time in the form of a rock that gashed her outer hull. A crew of Riveters was brought in to fix the damage. And when they got down there, what did they hear but the tap, tap, tap? They had heard the story. They knew that to twice that of any other vessel. And she was powered by a complex system of paddle wheels, propellers, and sailing masts. This was a phenomenal ship. They started building it in London, and by the time they got it finished, it took three and a half years. 2,000 men, riveters, carpenters, whatever, working on the ship. She was the dream of the most famous shipbuilder of the day, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, an Englishman nicknamed the Little Giant. His firm, the Great Western Railway Company, dominated the world. The Great Eastern was to be the jewel in his crown. Instead, it became his ship of doom. The trouble began the day the Great Eastern was launched. As she moved down the dry dock toward the water, a mooring cable snapped, whipped through the air, and killed two workers. After she was launched, crews continued working on the ship. While carpenters finished the deck, riveters worked on the Great Eastern's most unique feature, her double hull, an innovation for the day. Engineers believed this dual layer of iron would make the ship safer. Instead, it became an integral part of her mysterious haunting. Two of the riveters were missing. And they thought what had happened is that they had actually sealed themselves into this great ship by mistake. Well, I'm somewhere out there and uh, get out of here. I threw the covers back quickly, sat up, and nobody was there. They weren't real men. They were these shadowy figures that looked from a distance like they were sailors. And a voice said, I want you. Do phantoms wander the decks of aging vessels, searching for salvation that never comes? Do ghost ships prowl the high seas, serving as harbingers of doom for those who cross their bow? seafaring towns where ghostly tales are told by those who have spent their years at sea. So tell me, when you're standing watch late at night, you felt a tap on your shoulder, just a touch. Late at night you hear the cry of a whale, sounds from the sea. There's a ship called the Great Eastern five times the size of the largest ship of its day. It was the Titanic of its time. It was a cursed ship. The Great Eastern was a marvel to behold. 
When she was built in 1857, there was nothing else like her afloat. At 680 feet long, the Great Eastern was five times larger than any other ship. She could carry 4,000 passengers and 400 crew. from the days when men went down to the sea. From the darkest waters of the North Atlantic to the rocky coast of California, caught between the surface of the sea and the watery grave, lies the domain of haunted ships. I searched all over the place for these two riveters and I couldn't find them. The missing riveters were soon forgotten, but the Great Eastern's litany of troubles was just beginning. Ah! On her first sea trial, a boiler blew up. Three men died, five were scalded, and another crewman jumped overboard to avoid the explosion. He was crushed in the ship's thrashing paddle. When the ship dropped anchor, the captain and four others took a dinghy to shore. But the dinghy overturned and all five were drowned. Now, this just brought on more and more ideas from the public that this ship, something was wrong with the ship. Though she could hold 4,000, there were just 35 paying passengers aboard for her first Atlantic crossing. There was very little faith that the Great Eastern would work. You only have one chance uh, when you're at sea on board a ship. If you're not on, a, on board a ship that you trust, uh, you're in big trouble. Anything went wrong with the ship, anything out of the norm, people had a tendency to look at that ship as a voodoo ship or, you know, a vessel really to be afraid of. It was then that the haunting of the Great Eastern began. The men keep saying they're hearing this noise. Passengers and crew started to hear noises, tapping, moans and shouts coming from the ship's hull. An inspection turned up nothing. And I'm concerned. I have to look after the 